Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you all very cordially to our debate on how to restore faith in the UN Security Council. My name is uh, Thomas Paulsen. I'm a member of the executive board of Kerber Foundation, which is one of the larger private independent foundations in Germany, based in Hamburg. We are a, a proud founding member of the Paris Peace Forum. And as a founding member of the forum, let me say a big thank you to you all for participating uh, in this gathering and for uh, demonstrating or giving proof that there is still a, a substantial community uh, which thinks that it's a good idea to work together internationally in a multilateral setting and uh, who still believe that uh, there is a value in collective action. So in our work uh, in the Foundation on International Relations, we focus on several geographical areas, so Europe, Russia, Asia, and the Middle East. And with these uh, areas, we cover four permanent members of the UN Security Council. And arguably, uh, one of the regions which needs action, effective action of the UN Security Council most. According to the Charter of the United Nations, the primary responsibility of the UN Security Council is, I quote, the maintenance of international peace and security. While uh, we will probably all agree that the Council has often struggled to fulfill this task in the past, and while the Council has managed to keep up its day-to-day -day operations, it has been in deadlock over conflicts in Syria and in Ukraine for years now. Since its creation, the count, uh, 205 resolutions have been vetoed by at least one permanent member. Since 2014, 15 vetoes, uh, out of 15 vetoes, nine have referred to the war in Syria. And I think its inability to act on one of the greatest strategies of our time um, is really uh, a, a demonstration of the dysfunctional setup in many ways that we have in the Security Council. But of course the question is, if we think this setup doesn't work, what are the alternatives? And I think we are all also all aware that um, it is not so easy to come up with alternatives that are easy to implement. And I think we have to be honest about the reasons why it is so difficult to reform this UN Security Council. Next year, Germany will become a, uh, a member for two years in the UN Security Council, together with South Africa, Indonesia, Belgium, and the Dominican Republic. It does so at times of uh, great challenges in geopolitics in the international affairs area. And we as a German foundation will definitely follow the developments in the Security Council uh, very closely in the next two years. But we will not only follow it passively, we will also try to do something. Um, we have a program together with the Munich Security Conference. It's called Munich Young Leaders. And we have now 250 uh, members of this network. And uh, we are planning uh, for our the, the 10th annual meeting of the Munich Young Leaders next year in New York, actually. And they will um, work on a publication uh, of how to reinvigorate multilateral cooperation in the world. The, and we will present this publication at the sidelines of the uh, General Assembly in autumn. So stay tuned for their insights. We will make sure that you will hear about them. But now let's listen to what this distinguished panel will have to say about how to restore faith in the UN Security Council. The discussants are Nadja Murat, who will be with us in a minute or so. She has still, she had a meeting with the French president and she is on her way. Almut Vilan Karimi, Smile Shergi, Martin Kobler, and Bruno Stanju Ugarte. Ian Bremmer will moderate the discussion. I'm proud that Kerber Foundation hosts this very important discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the floor, please.
thank you very much. Uh, we have plenty of time uh, for a really rich conversation, both with our panelists uh, as well as to take questions from the audience. Um, I, I'll, I'll kick it off with just a couple of minutes. When we talk about restoring faith uh, in the Security Council, let's at least stock up a couple of reasons why we've lost a fair amount of faith. Uh, the first is that to the extent that the United States and its allies were critical in creating the United Nations in the aftermath of World War II, it was on the basis of shared values. Uh, it was on the basis of uh, commitment to human rights, uh, to liberal democracy, um, to a free market system. Uh, frankly, all of which are more open to question today as both the United States and its allies to varying degrees are experiencing a level of crisis within the liberal democratic system. So if, if you aren't as certain that the countries of the West, the advanced industrial democracies, really stand up for the values that they created the United Nations and the Security Council by, you're going to lose some faith in the Security Council. Uh, Russia, the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, you know, in the Cold War, of course, it was pretty clear where a lot of your vetoes were going to come from, either from the West um, or from the Soviets. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a hope for a brief period of time that you've broken through that. And yet it seems very clear that the position of the Russians in the international order today is increasingly one of a spoiler. It's one that's revisionist. It's one that is trying to divide uh, and take advantage of divisions, but also divide the Western order itself and take advantage of divisions inside liberal democracies. And then we have China, which we would all agree has been an extraordinary, perhaps a unique success story of the past 50 years. And yet the presumption of a majority of those in the West was that as China became wealthier, that they would take on many of the values and the priorities that the Americans and allies had enshrined in the United Nations. And yet what we see is that much of that presumption was incorrect. China has indeed gotten wealthier, but they've only consolidated power as an authoritarian regime since then. Uh, they've only bolstered their state capitalist economy since then. And so to the extent that they're doing a lot in their interest to ensure a stable world order, it is not aligned within the institutions or the values of advanced industrial democracies to the most part. So I think that's a background by which we all have lost some faith in a Security Council that, to be fair, um, was never quite perfect, um, but was perhaps more aspirational as the sort of model that we wanted um, to achieve. So with that, um, we're going to talk mostly about solutions, but I want to at least give the panelists the opportunity to talk about where they have seen their faith shaken, where they need to see their faith restored. So let me do that with our panelists, um, and let me uh, start um, with uh, Bruno um, on that issue. Why don't, you, why don't you give us a couple of moments uh, on where you think the biggest challenges are? Well, if we look at the failures of the Security Council, the list will just run on and on and on. But we're meeting here, basically, as we have this war on Yemen raging. And the travesty of Yemen is that it's the world's most dire humanitarian situation, cholera epidemic, near famine. And we basically have all of the tools we need in order to find a ceasefire and to bring peace to Yemen and to stop the terrible human rights violations that are occurring there from alleged war crimes and all. Yet we, what we have is this total abdication from the Security Council. Um, when we say that it's impossible for countries to come together and find a solution way forward for Yemen, I would actually turn them to another organ of the Security of, of the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, where the Netherlands led a very principled initiative to try to investigate violations committed by all sides in Yemen. And against the US, the UK, and France, and Saudi Arabia, and the Emiratis, they got that resolution through. So to me, that's a testament that when you have courageous leadership by a small and medium-sized nation, even if that be it, you can have change. Unfortunately, we don't get it in the Security Council because of 
the fact that not pe the fact that they're all just divided because of their geopolitical interests. If you look, for example, at Myanmar, another terrible situation that is ongoing. Once again, we have no leadership in the Security Council. Um, we have a pen holder, which is the UK, which is basically distracted and missing in action. Um, and yet, if you turn to another organ of the United Nations, this time again, the Human Rights Council, you get a resolution, led this time by the European Union, which is looking into all of the serious human rights violations occurring in Myanmar. And so what I want to say with this is that, yes, there are serious issues with the Security Council because of the fact that the problems lie with its members. It's not the organ itself. The organ has all of the tools it needs. It has tremendous liberty to establish subsidiary bodies, all types of commissions, all types of mandates. Even US peacekeeping is an invasion. It's an invention of the Security Council. So it's got everything it needs. All we need is just a degree of common sense, of common dignity from those members who sit on the Security Council, starting with the P5. And interestingly, when they sit in another configuration, like the Human Rights Council, or at times in the General Assembly, you can get things done. Concern about the Human Rights Council, given the new American stance on it? Well, the U.S. certainly did not participate in the last session, and yet it was a very productive session, which had very interesting results on Yemen, uh, on Burma. So Iceland, I think, is filling the seat well. Well done. Uh, Ahmed, please, to you. Well, I'd, I'd also like to start with, with uh, mentioning the long list of, of countries or regions where the United Nations Security Council has failed. Syria, Libya, uh, Yemen for sure, uh, South Sudan and many others. However, this is, a, this is a body, a Security Council of 193 member states. And I think the, it's crippled by many handicaps. And the biggest handicap right now is that the five permanent members are not representing the geopolitical situation we're in right now. As you mentioned earlier, it was created uh, nearly 70 years ago. That was a totally different situation. So, and in a situation where we are, I don't think that we should put too much effort in trying to reform it. I think it's impossible. So all these energy we, s we spend on trying to reform it should rather be spent on finding solutions for the problems we can solve with this Security Council. And one of the, the hopes, from my perspective, are the 10 non-permanent members. I mean, they are elected for two years, and as well, they have a lot of uh, divisions in opinions like the five permanent ones, but there's always these initiative, initiatives coming out. I mean, you mentioned one, there have been initiatives on women, peace and security, there have been initiatives on, on, on children in armed conflict, and I think they are important to be mentioned here, because on the ground they can bring about change. So, um, and the other issue I'd like to mention is, you started with a Western perspective onto the Security Council, but of course, where you stand is where you sit. So there are different opinions about the functionality or dysfunctionality of the Security Council. And I'm happy that we have Smail Shegui with us with an African perspective, but there might be other perspectives like in China, for example, and the Chinese have become very active in the Security Council. They, they organized um, a session last week on the crisis of multilateralism. They will organize another one on peacekeeping in Africa. They're one of the, among the P5 who have the most troops on the ground, peacekeeping troops, uh, number 11 on the list. And of course, there might be many reasons to be skeptical about it, but it is a e development none of us has foreseen. So talking about the UN Security Council, I think we should, we should be open enough to understand that they should represent 193 uh, countries and that there are many different perspectives. And there are many countries who have also had, had the chance of having a peacekeeping operation on the ground that was successful to a certain extent. Very good. Martin, to you. with what Almut said, but I, I would uh, also here uh, have a slightly different of, uh, opinion. It's very clear that the Security Council is a product of 1945 uh, and that it does not reflect uh, the 21st century. I mean, I would not give up the idea 
of really making the Security Council fit for the 21st century. But one can marry these two ideas, to really insist on Security Council reform, on having a stronger African representation. Africa is not represented in any case, but also not, not other countries here in the world. That's why, as a German, I mean, you will not be surprised that I really am, am lobbying for a, uh, for a Security Council reform reflecting the 21st century. Uh, this is not only related to Germany, it's also related to Africa and others. Now, but the other question is, you can do one thing and not neglect the others. I think the agenda setting of the Security Council, there should be a common denominator. Uh, for example, the early warning, for example, the conflict prevention, uh, to really see where conflicts can be prevented. Now, you have spoken about these terrible conflicts raging, raging around. Where can conflicts be prevented? And then really to form in this very difficult period where we all feel that the world is disintegrating, that multilateralism is under, undermined by, uh, by some, to form an alliance of those who support multilateralism, a kind of alliance of multilateralists, and above all, strengthening all multilateral organizations and regional organizations, and uh, the uh, relation, for example, to the African Union, but also to the European Union. I do not see very much. I do not see very much here. The European Union is not a factor. I mean, we listened yesterday to the speeches of President Macron and, uh, and of uh, uh, Mrs. Merkel, but where is the European Union as a power factor, like the African Union, with the same kind of uh, link to the, uh, to the uh, United Nations. It's not there. So, and I think the European Union also can play a, a role here. Now, coming back to the agenda setting, I think the agenda setting is important to find common denominators. And why not finding also in a world which we feel is disintegrating now, finding common denominators in the conflict in, in Africa, despite of the fact that this is, has been going on now for quite some time, but in particular, the early warning where our future conflicts are rising um, and uh, everybody is you see I mean telling stories about conflict prevention or so but nobody really does it the word I hear most we should we need to but who really does something? So to work on, the, on this field of conflict prevention, but also bringing the like-minded together, this alliance uh, of multilateralists uh, who are able to bring a, um, an agenda forward, uh, they all can agree on, even in, difficult, uh, in a difficult period where multilateralism is threatened. And Smile, we talk about Africa, not always the best story from the Security Council. Why don't you give us your perspective? Thank you. I'm happy to continue in the same lines with my colleagues to say that we are the most concerned about the actual situation in the Security Council and the threat against multilateralism. Because this is coming at a time when we have adopted a very uh, far-reaching programs like uh, the Agenda 2063 uh, in relation with the UN uh, 2030 and we thought that this is the time if we all agree that uh, the responses to crisis is not only security but it's also development so this is maybe the, the the most critical time when we need a strong UN with a delivering security council but it's amazing also to see that one of the important words we all use here and there is governance so, but when it comes to the way the Security Council still continue to work, I think, let's face it here, I think it's not very democratic until now. I think it, it will be democratic if it will be enlarged, if Africa has its, its own seat or two seats in that Security Council, if the methods of work of the Security Council also uh, are looked at, and uh, I think, above all, we need that very important organ. And here I want to, uh, to underline that we don't have another option. I mean, this has been said here at the opening, that we can't think of uh, another organization that, than UN today. So let's really uh, see how we can improve it, how we can make it more democratic. And to this effect, I think, 
especially with the difficulties that we do have now, I think regional organizations can really offer an alternative. And that's what we are doing actually with the ever strong uh, partnership that we have with UN. The, uh, you know that we have two, ses two meetings of the two councils, our Peace and Security Council and the Security Council every year, both in New York and in Addis Ababa. And we are working for even joint uh, visits on the ground. I think this is very important to build on it. But more importantly, as Africa Union Commission, we are also benefiting from the UN for uh, capacity building in terms of, for example, uh, compliance, in terms of uh, financial rules, in terms of all these policies uh, against the abuse of women or violence against women, uh, uh, in terms of uh, prevention, it has been said here. So I think uh, more than ever, we should all endeavor to reinforce this organization, but also put it in, in perspective and in, uh, uh, in compliance with the, what I say, the global governance. So even in discussing the challenges, you already see from this group the beginnings of where people are developing new areas of hope, the regional organizations to start, but also some, or some, some powers, some countries, some actors that we haven't seen as much from historically. And I would point to two, and I want to ask you about them. The first, you say that an organization of the, the bringing the new multilateralists, a coalition of the willing effectively. And it seems to me two of the countries that would be most interested in that, your own Germany, also Japan, not coincidentally two countries that when the UN was founded were the most hobbled and constrained uh, in terms of their own foreign policy and security. Secondly, China, as you discussed, Ahmed, which of course we weren't thinking or expecting very much from 20 years ago, maybe even 10, but today in terms of their willingness to contribute, you know, I'll talk to Antonio Gutierrez about this. He'll say, you'd be stunned with how much support he feels like he's getting from the Chinese from many pieces of his agenda that UN security uh, general secretaries would not have been saying. So I'm interested in how both of you think that these new countries coming in and changing the geopolitical order are going to change the way we think about the challenges and the opportunities of the Security Council and of maintaining global security going forward. I'd love to hear a little bit from both of you on that. Maybe I'll start with you, Ahmed. We'll be talking about the UN Security Council and its main objective and its main task is to bring about peace and security in this world. This is really a big task, and it's, it's the biggest part of the UN Charter. So when we're talking about bringing about peace and security, first of all, of course, it's all about the political will. The UN can only be so strong as its 193 member states or the, the 15 on the Security Council, and of course, all the P5 with the veto power. So that is the first layer. The second layer is, if you decide something in the Security Council, and you decide that you have a peace operation, whether a peacekeeping operation or your special political mission or whatever measurement in order to bring about peace in a certain place, then of course you need the ones who do that. And sometimes the ones sitting around the table discussing a political mandate, they are not the ones doing the work on the ground. So you have a big divide between the troop contributing countries, the police contributing countries, the ones contributing qualified civilian experts, and of course the ones sitting at the table. So I think if the Chinese, if they provide peacekeeping troops, this is the first time then that the ones who are, who are deciding on a mandate also will deliver on the ground. And I'm not saying that this is the best option, but I think what it will help, and it will really help better implementing peace and security is the ones taking political decisions, getting involved in implementing them. Because parts of the problem we have is they're good decisions and they're, uh, they're good mandates. But 
uh, I would say it's the implementation stupid. It's not that we don't know. We know all the ideas that how a security council could be reformed. There are many, many uh, suggestions how to do that. There are many good ideas, uh, and there are all the instruments uh, at hand, as Bruno mentioned earlier. You have everything from the good officers to to people who are, who are doing political advice. We have good conflict uh, and, uh, uh, analysts on behalf, troops, we have police, we have everything there. But what is missing is the link between the political decision and the implementation on the ground. So the Chinese will be the first to combine those two. And I mean, you asked us to be optimistic. So I said that might be a chance. And of course, it would be much better if the others followed this example as well. And if it's not the political mandate by the P5 and the troops from South Asia or from Africa, because that's that's not going to work in the future. And how, how do you see? I mean, if do you believe the Chinese in five and ten years' time will end up playing a much more fundamental role in the UN? And and if they do, given that they are a a, a, a country at a very different level of development with a very different type of type of government. How does that make you, does it change the way you think about global security, the priorities, the different priorities that might come from that? Of course, no one is going to predict the future, but uh, as I said earlier, none of us knew five years ago. And then it's the question, why would people get more involved in the United Nations? It's also the question why the United States, for example, do not want to be involved anymore. That's, that's another question. Uh, but when people get involved, at least I see the opportunity uh, for for this for this bridging the gap between the implementation and the political mandate, whether it will really whether we'll really have better peace operations is totally a different question because it also depends on very much on what kind of conflicts we are we have and for example the ones you mentioned in Syria and in Yemen and South Sudan the, the the difficult issue about those is there is no peace to keep. So who do you send to a place where there is war on, on various levels, international war? So, so that is, I think, the really challenging question we have. And of course, you, this, you, can only, you, the, you can only find a solution if you have the political will of the main actors involved. Bruno, you want to jump in? Yeah, two finger on China. I don't want us to leave with the impression that having China more engaged in the UN only comes with good things. You know, when Chinese peacekeepers came to South Sudan, it was basically to protect oil fields. It was not to do protection of civilians, which presumably should be the very core mandate of a UN peacekeeping mission. When China has become more engaged in the UN, what it basically is doing is suppressing, for example, the possibility of dissidents to come to UN fora in order to speak about the situation inside China. And China is wielding much of its financial and political pressure from the Secretary General on down so that issues that are close to the interests of China are not considered by the UN body as a whole. So there is a much darker side to Chinese engagement with the UN, notwithstanding some of the good things coming out from potential increased peacekeeping. So that's what I was kind of getting at with my question, right, is that on the one hand, um, you have a country that much of the new architecture they're setting up is not multilateral, it's hub and spoke, it's one belt, one road, it's not transparent, it's low standard, right? On the other hand, historically, one of the reasons you brought the Chinese into the World Trade Organization was the idea that by doing so, they would become more multilateral. They would bring their cases to the WTO as opposed to try to strong arm them. And so I guess I would come back to you and say, do you believe that the Chinese getting much more involved in a historically Western-led United Nations multilateral organization will necessarily, to what extent will that bring the standards of the UN down? Or to what extent will it actually bring the Chinese, make them more engaged with the standards that many of us, I think, would like to see? Well, I guess the big question is going to be to what degree the Chinese and others will allow the United Nations to continue to look into issues that are happening within the domestic jurisdiction of right. countries. And what do you think about that? Well, China obviously has been a stalwart in saying, no, what happens within a country's borders should just be left to that country. And so that is where you need courage from the Secretary General. You need courage from the other members of the Security Council, courage from other members of the Human Rights Council, and so forth, so that those values and principles that are enshrined in the UN Charter, which is we the peoples, yes, where we think about the peoples and what is happening to the peoples, are not lost because of the fact that now we have this commitment to what happens within your jurisdiction is simply your own business, which is basically the Chinese mantra, unfortunately. And the U.S. mantra to a degree. 
these days. Um, but, you know, a little controversy is okay. Um, so, uh, Martin, uh, again, new actors coming in. You were talking clearly about the Germans. Uh, I mentioned the Japanese. Others, who are your coalition of the willing, the new multilateralists? Who do you think moves the needle the most in the next five and ten years? And how does it matter? Well, it will certainly not be Germany and Japan changing the global order here. So the Chinese example is is, is a very valid one. However, I witnessed in, in my uh, practical work, I witnessed in the last, well, let's say, five to seven years, a relatively smart and constructive uh, Chinese role in the Security Council here. Of course, nothing comes without an agenda. But now coming to these questions we, we, we mentioned on, on how Japan and Germany and others, I would say the Europeans, uh, could change uh, the game. I think one has to differentiate between all these aspirin questions, I call them. You see efficiency of um, peacekeeping uh, and, and things like this. Uh, this is really only the symptoms. And with peacekeeping and a better regime of peacekeeping, you treat the symptoms. But you do not go to the roots. Now, the roots is a political consensus among Security Council members about the resolution of a political conflict. If you do not have this consensus, you can spend billions of dollars in peacekeeping and it will not change. This is, of course, natural resources, uh, this is a geostrategic uh, uh, position, in particular in, in Africa. But uh, this alliance, or you call it coalition of the willing of multilateralists, they should have an agreement on how to solve a political conflict emerging on the horizon. And only then you can address the question about the tools, and peacekeeping is one of the tools. And I have the impression we always start, uh, you see, uh, from the back, and uh, there is a conflict arising, and then everybody says, peacekeeping. We need a special political mission, we need a peacekeeping operation, uh, but this cannot solve the problem. So, the agreement among those who want to support multilateralism, and I count the Chinese, despite of what you said, um, I count the Chinese among them, is really to have an agreement on the emerging conflicts, on the existing conflicts, and then to discuss the tools. Now, Germany and Japan, they, uh, at least Germany in the next two years, they will address exactly this. I mean, we were commemorating yesterday here the uh, 100th um, anniversary of the end of the First World War, and I heard the impressive speeches of both President Macron and, and Merkel with, a, with a, an, a, a really a plea for multilateralism. And thinking back to the League of Nations after the First World War, I mean, we had, I mean, where they could not withstand the power of nationalism, which immediately paved the way for the Second World War. Now, we are in not the same situation, but we see some signs on the horizon of nationalism and so, and that's why it's all the more important, I mean, to address this question of making the UN stronger, but with strong partners. Coalition of the Willing, you mentioned Germany. I again would like to introduce the European Union. Why are we speaking of the African Union and not so much of the European Union? So let me push back a little bit on that because because, I mean, when we talk, you've now twice sort of intervened and said, we need to hear more from Europe, we need to hear more from the Europeans. Uh, this has been a fantastic initiative by President Macron. On the other hand, his approval ratings right now are 26%. Merkel gave an extraordinary speech yesterday. On the other hand, she's not there for much longer. Um, the European Union, we're about to have parliamentary elections in May. Uh, most people believe that the neoliberal consensus around Europe is going to get a lot weaker as a consequence of that. And I was with Kissinger last week, and his view was Europe is so incredibly tied up in its internal problems right now, we haven't even mentioned Brexit, that the ability to make a big ask of the Europeans to think outside Europe seems a much taller order than it would have been 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Push back on me and tell me why we should be more optimistic that Europe can do more. No, definitely. If you look back in Europe, um, let's say 10 years after 9-11, I mean, we had strong politicians uh, Yeah, later than Mrs. Merkel came, and she was, uh, I mean, young in her political career and, and strong, but not very much moved in the European Union. 
Um, I'm coming from Pakistan. The Chinese play an important role in Pakistan with the Chinese Pakistani economic corridor leading to the One Belt, One Road. More so every day. Yes. My question is why didn't the Europeans discover way back? with strong politicians at that time, let's say in 2002, 2003, why didn't the Europeans discover the European connectivity? Now the train have, has less, left the station, and the Chinese were uh, inventing, so to say, the one belt, one road, and the, European, uh, are in the, the Europeans are in the defensive. So it's not a matter of the actual state of the Brexit. Yes, there are problems in Europe, but Europe as a power factor, the European Union as a power factor will remain. I agree it's not too strong right now with outgoing politicians, with the outgoing countries, but it was not very much different 10 years ago where nobody thought of the Brexit. Now, and, and, and these kind of things is my plea to engage more the European Union as a political factor. They are an economic factor and to discover politics within the European Union and to uh, join this coalition of the, of the willing here or the alliance of multilateralists uh, in a way the African Union does. So the triumph of hope against experience. Let me, Smell, let me ask you, you had mentioned um, that you believe that one of the areas of hope was in the regional organizations, yours, but also others. Give us some reasons. Point us in a direction that would, that would put some flesh on that bone. I think the, the best example maybe is what we have done ourselves in, uh, in Somalia, AMISO. It's an African-led operation which has allowed us to uh, to to take more than 80 percent from those uh, criminals and uh, uh, of shabab uh, the other example is uh, you spoke about the islands of the willing what we have in in the lakchad basing the mngtf force which has been created by the the countries of the region and I think today, uh, terrorist Boko Haram is not holding any specific area in, in the region. So I think uh, what we have done also on LRA, we had a joint task force on LRA, and today I think we are left only with maybe uh, some uh, hundreds of those uh, remaining. And. Uh, I mean, the, the civilians are, uh, are not suffering like before. This is one of the examples of the importance of uh, regional groupings. So we think that, uh, I mean, you, I'm, not defend, I'm not going to defend China, but I think in, in, in South Sudan, the deployment of China was mainly engineers. So uh, I think in, in that event, also, they have lost two of their peacekeepers. They were trapped like others. But uh, I think this is maybe a good example on the way to work in, in reinforcing uh, the relation between UN and us. It's the comparative advantage that Africa Union can bring, for example, when it comes to our continent. And you know that 70% of the work of the, peace, of the Security Council is devoted to the situations in Africa. And seven out of uh, 14 uh, UN missions are in Africa. So I think uh, what we need is really to uh, reinforce uh, this relation. And maybe the best example is what we have done in, uh, in DRC by deploying that, uh, the uh, FEB, yeah, which is composed of Africans with a robust mandate to do and deal with the uh, armed groups at the east of the RC. I think uh, we have duplicated somehow that in South Sudan with the protection force, which hopefully will help us in implementing the, the agreement now. And I think it can also be duplicated in, uh, in North Mali. So we need a creative approach. Uh, and uh, as the... Uh, the, the HIPPO report uh, arrived to the conclusion that UN is not ready to change now its own doctrine on peacekeeping. And my colleagues are saying in some situations there is no peace to keep. 
But on the other hand, you have so many challenges and we need to go and protect those people. So I think, I think uh, under this angle, maybe we can find a better way of addressing the complex, very complex situation that we have today. And uh, uh, the, it, it goes first, as I told you, with uh, uh, reinforcing and supporting the proposals of uh, Secretary General uh, Guterres of uh, reforming uh, the UN system. I think we are for that. And we are hoping also that we'll, be, uh, we'll have the occasion to, uh, within our African-led operation, to benefit from assess contributions. Because we do have the, the political will, we have the political determination, we can uh, have uh, in, in, uh, in, 15, in 15 days, we can generate a force, but we need uh, the support uh, and predictable support from the international community. And here we have to recall that the, the prime responsibility of the Security Council on peace and security, uh, uh, I mean, that responsibility is within the Security Council. Martin Jane, please jump in. Yeah, just to continue here, sure. I think we are concentrating too much on the failures uh, and uh, yeah, with the, with the challenges. Uh, but I mean, there were, as you say, and uh, you said there are innovations in the peacekeeping system, like the Force Intervention Brigade in the DRC. Yep. Um, we have successes, and we have had successes. And this was is uh, Cote d'Ivoire, this is Liberia, this is Timor Leste, this is Namibia, this is Cambodia. Yes, some of these missions they are already a few decades away, but uh, there, in particular in Africa, I mean, there were considerable successes. So to discuss all the time this, uh, how the world uh, is challenged by terrorism and, and whatever, um, we should really analyze why were these missions successful. Uh, and the Force Intervention Brigade is an excellent example. Uh, you see, 10 years ago, nobody in the United Nations was speaking about intelligence. This was a taboo word. There is nothing like intelligence. There is maybe information gathering or uh, something like this. We detabuized with the innovative projects of the Force Intervention Brigade fighting in the Congo, robust peacekeeping. If you want to have United Nations fight, as you say, or the African Union fight, you need proper intelligence. So we detabuized this world. So the tools became much better. They are much more focused now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Also interesting that a bunch of the places you're talking about where you've seen some successes historically are places where, let's face it, the great power didn't have any abiding interest in intervening right now to the extent that the United States is to a degree saying not our problem more than they used to and I think that's structural to the extent the Chinese are saying everything has commercial interest but we're not building a blue water Navy we're not putting bases all over the place and to the extent that many of the challenges that are coming up these days in security actually come from non-state actors which are not as geopolitically geopolit engaging to the great powers. Does that give us reason to be more hopeful that an organization like the United Nations will have, will rack up, will be able to rack up some greater successes precisely because there'll be fewer countries that'll say, no, 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 I, I'm the one that has sway. I'm going to exercise my veto or else on this issue. Anyone have a view on that? Bruno, you look like you do. Partly, yes. I mean, I, I obviously I recognize the importance of non-state actors and the degree to which they can be disruptive, but we must not lose sight of the fact that many times behind a non-state actor, a there actor. is a state actor. Sure. So it's proxy, actually. So I think that we're still missing the crux of the problem. Um, since I take Martin's point that we shouldn't be too much about the failures, but also look into some of the successes, um, I do think it's it's very important um, that we take lessons from the three post-mortems that were done of probably three of the greatest failures by the UN, Rwanda, Bosnia, Bosnia and uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka yeah. All three pointed to the need for the UN to basically do early warning and prevention, which was, was Martin was talking about. And that is where I think the Security Council has an enormous job to do. But also I think the Secretary General has a remarkable role to play. There is one article in the UN Charter that most people don't want to make reference, 
including the Secretary General himself, which is Article 99, which basically gives the Secretary General the power to tell the Security Council what it needs to know and not what it wants to hear. It's one of the most least utilized articles. Because when we talk about the Security Council, I think we must also talk about the entire system. Um, and in this sense, I think that we have successes whenever a Secretary General has had the moral courage to come and tell the Security Council where it's missing in action. And if you see some of the great successes that you've mentioned, many times there was a considerable role by the Secretary General and his team in basically trying to steer the Security Council to where it should move. And that is, I think, something that Antonio Gutierrez should learn about and try to follow up, for example, in the, I would say, in the legacy of a Dag Hammarskjöld, who used Article 99 in a brilliant way. Do you like the idea of just one term for a sec gen as a consequence of that? creating a little more support for courageousness as opposed to having to politic for another term? I guess one term would be better, but in many ways we should be having anyhow competitive elections to begin with and not having this election basically being limited to the P5 and thereby negotiating all of the uh, top jobs of the UN, which we all know come to the P5. That's hard, but I get you. Ahmed. Well, what... The, the issue you're alluding to is about leadership. Yes. I think it does matter a lot, and it's oftentimes is underrated in the sense that you need, of course, a system in place and you need institutions in place. But, of course, it depends on the one who sits at the table in the Security Council. It for sure depends very much on the Secretary General. It depends on the heads of agencies. It depends on the special representatives in, in the field who do work there. It depends on the leadership in the African Union. It depends on leadership in other uh, European organizations. But of course, I mean, coming back to the U European Union, I am a convinced European citizen, and I wish the European Union would be more active. But I've just been to a security conference in Eastern Europe. I mean, if you talk there about the United Nations, it actually was a panel on the United Nations, apart from the five of us sitting on the pan panel being all over the place that what we have achieved and how many reforms and the action for peacekeeping and the HIPAA report and Brahimi. I think the rest in the audience kind of gave us a puzzle. Look, what are you talking about, the United Nations? Um, and they are, of course, looking more for bilateral solutions. And they are looking for bilateral solutions not on a global scale, but in their neighborhood. So when we talk about globalization and the changing world order, I think what we'll also see that there is a trend that with the regional organizations or even major powers in a region, that they will take responsibility for their region. And of course, then, it's the question of what kind of role can the United Nations play. So the chapter eight for strengthening cooperation with regional op organizations is a very important one. And there are concrete examples. For example, the, the crisis in Ukraine. Everybody gave each other a puzzled look, what do we do now? And then there was a look to, towards the Security Council, which everybody shrugging the shoulders for obvious reasons. And there was an organization that the, the, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And they created a mission also in two weeks' time. It's only composed of civilian experts, people without weapons, people from all the participating states, and with about 800 monitors working on the line of control. And of course, it's kind of getting to the point where it's a frozen conflict, and there have been 10,000 uh, people died in this conflict, and there's lots of, of uh, refugees and thousands of problems. But the question is, and you asked the question earlier, what is, when is a peace operation efficient? Mm -hmm. Is it when it's delivering its mandate, closing the door, and there is peace and harmony and everybody is happy? Or when there is least, there is less violence, and there's not an eruption of another conflict? And of course, we have to talk, seriously talk about what is the measurement for effectiveness of the United Nations. And then, of course, it's also about expectation management. In many places, we deploy missions. It's, for, it's not really of bringing about peace. This is unrealistic. It's rather of making sure there's not an eruption of even more violence. So I'm really glad that you brought up leadership. And I wanted to ask you, Martin, as someone who's had a key position in the field, to what extent 
do you think that effectiveness of the Security Council also comes from personalities? also comes from individuals who are, whether it's a special envoy or whether it's a head of mission that is particularly passionate and capable. In other words, usually when we talk about Security Council reform, we almost always are talking top down about these very challenging things to do that have structural blockages, where sometimes, you know, it's the other way around that we end up seeing some of the most remarkable changes with people that are passionate, that you really believe in, that just forces an issue and agenda on the table. You've had a lot of experience in these roles. I, I think that everyone here would find it interesting if you could share a little bit of that. Well, there are there is no one size fits all. You see, I tell you a story when I was uh, when I was a student at school. We were that's what I was looking. For, we were yes. we were we were told at school uh, that the first world war erupted. I thought to myself, why did it erupt? I mean, there were politicians, there were people, there were personalities. It is not a natural course of history that a war erupts. There are people who are taking decisions, good decisions, bad decisions, and they are responsible that the wars are erupting. But our history teachers always always said, well, the war, it, it was obligatory that the First World War came about in this passive voice. Now, this is a topic I'm very much interested in. But one cannot say that it's only personalities. Uh, you have people like Lakhtar Brahimi, uh, like Kofi Annan, who rapidly gave up the Syria file. I mean, they were the best the United Nations had. So one cannot always say that it's the personalities or the politicians. So there are some constraints. But in principle, I totally agree. It is the, in particular in the peacekeeping field, leadership is the most important thing. There, there is somebody, but on all levels, not only the SRSG, but to empower people uh, to, to, to take decisions. The biggest threat of a peacekeeping operation comes from inaction, not from action. In, in my experience, it was always action which brought things forward, like you mentioned the Force Intervention Brigade and very difficult leadership decisions, I mean, to go to war as United Nations. Now, this is not very easy, in particular for a pacifist like myself, but I, I had a tandem force commander and we took this decision together and then just uh, counter-checked with, with New York and things were done. Now, leadership is, is extremely important uh, on, on all levels. Uh, and um, another Another um, idea I would like to inject into the discussion is, because we have spoken about, about Europe and uh, Security Council and these kind of things, what is the role of the people? I mean, are these elite projects or would situation be better if you incorporate as we try in Europe to do it in Europe, you go to the people, you go back to the people, in particular the young people. 60% in most of the countries in Africa, in Asia, are below the age of 30. Now, to restore the faith of the Security Council, of the United Nations, to give it more credibility, more reliability, I mean, they need the support also of the people who have to tell their leaders then, I mean, to uh, really uh, bring things ahead. Now, this is just an idea. We try to do it with youth, the Secretary General also, with youth ambassadors. Everybody has this youth ambassadors now, which I think is an extremely good thing to instrumentalize really large parts of the populations to influence their politicians, again, I mean, to, uh, to do it. But coming back to your question on leadership, extremely useful, but not the only solution, like the example of Kofi Annan and Lakta Brahimi shows. So, please. I think uh, I do agree with uh, all my colleagues that leadership is very important, critical. But Martin has been uh, humble in not underlying his frustration. He was a very good leader in, in DRC, but also in Libya. But I think when you don't have that harmony that we are looking for, for the members of the Security Council and the big players, we end in a, in a situation where a conflict is, is, is prolonged because they could not agree on how to solve the problem. And the best example today is Libya. Libya is a very rich country with a, a limited population of six million, but 
yet since 2011, where we advanced uh, a peaceful plan and we were, our, our, our uh, committee of five heads, uh, heads of state were prevented even to fly to Tripoli. But then this country uh, not only has been destroyed, I mean, uh, but today this is the, the best hub of um, all traffics. Uh, and the situation that you have today in the, in the Sahel is mainly the consequence of what has been done in Libya. So uh, I think leadership is, is very important, and yeah, this, is, uh, this is valid for uh, international organizations, but also in, in different countries. But uh, I think it's not enough. We need really to avoid double standards or uh, making uh, the uh, national interests above what uh, the reality of the ground demands. Because uh, if today Libya is, uh, I mean, until now we are pushing for to organize even a meeting of reconciliation of the Libyans. And we don't have the necessary push to organize it. Because Libya is a, is a rich country and you have followed what uh, the, the, the different plans between the Conference of Paris and today the conference in Italy. So I think at the end of the day, this is an African problem and uh, uh, the, 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 all the players should understand also that they have to give that possibility to those who, are, who have the proxy with that situation maybe they can uh, find easily the best uh, durable solution to those crises. So we, we all agree this is becoming harder, not easier. It's becoming more urgent. Um, I, I guess I want to ask, um, if we are going to have a breakthrough, if in the next five, ten years, we were in an environment where suddenly we became much more optimistic about the Security Council and its ability to help resolve some of these very intractable problems. What would have happened? What's the thing that you think is most likely to lead to that kind of a breakthrough? And I think I want to start with you, Bruno, because behind the scenes when we were talking about this, you were the most pessimistic and said, give me a chance to think about it. So it's been an hour. What, what, what's the thing that it makes you potentially think we could be more optimistic? Well, I, I think uh, the elected members have an indispensable role to play. And in light of the inability of the Security Council to live up to its responsibilities in many situations, I think that probably what we need is a bit of a, a, bit of a revolution from within the Security Council, by which I mean nothing more than basically having the elected members decide to walk out of the Security Council when a situation as serious as Assyria or a Yemen or a Myanmar is not being addressed rightfully and forcefully by the Security Council. What do I mean by this? In order for, to have the Security Council in action, you need nine members. If you have less than nine, no action can be taken. I would really like to see a walkout of the elected members so that you just put the Security Council on a hiatus for some time. I think that would really rock the permanent members out of the comfort that they have in having the veto, in the comfort that they have in somehow showing solidarity with one another, notwithstanding some of the histrionics. So I think that would be something that is worthwhile considering. The day that Germany and Japan and uh, Dominican Republic could decide we're walking out of the Security Council because frankly, we're not living up to our responsibilities. I think that would be a shocker moment. Please. That's one scenario. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's very optimistic. <laughs> However, another scenario could be that, of course, there is still the Security Council, but the ton 10 non-permanent members will take on more responsibility. There would be a lot of push from regional organizations. There would be the alliance of multilateralists supporting this, and at least the P5 would not use their veto. And then, of course, it would be would make big progress. But of course, the the what will will always stay with us. If there's conflicts in the world and there's more internationalized internationalized conflicts, the P5 and everybody else has a stake in this. Now, 
I'm going to turn to the audience for questions and also to the iPad. But before I do, you'll all have noticed that we've welcomed someone else to the stage, uh, Nadia Murad, who was a little late. Please, I think. She was a little late, which normally we would never tolerate, but apparently she had a meeting with the president. So I think we're going to give her a pass on this. Now, Nadia, um, we've been talking about the challenges of Security Council reform and creating more security in a world that we've been a little disappointed in our capacity to do so. You've lived through this in a very dramatic way, personally. That's why you have a Nobel. But you've also just met with the French president, who's personally been very committed both through this forum as well as through his presidency, young as it is, to try to make a difference on these issues. Now, you just came from that meeting, so I think everyone in this room would be really interested if you could tell us if you got a little more optimistic having just met with Mr. Macron and to talk to us a little bit about why you have or have not. شكراً وأسفة على التأخير منذ عام 2014 وأنا رسالتي كانت في مجلس الأمن في عام 2015 نشتغل مع مع اليو إن ومع مجلس الأمن بسبب جرائم داعش وإبادة داعش ضد الإيزيدين في في سنجار الكثير من الدول أو البرلمانات اعترفت بالإبادة ضد الإيزيدين والداعش نفسه طلع وحكى وأنطى فيديوهات كيف كان هدفه القضاء على الإيزيدين وعلى هذه الأقلية في عدنا فقط الأسبوع اللي فات فريق يوين كان في سنجار واكتشف 69 مقبرة جماعية للإيزيدين في سنجار حتى بعد بعد قرار مجلس الأمن في إنشاء فريق للإقامة بتوثيق الجرائم في سنجار هذا الفريق أيضا كمل بعد سنة ونص من القرار والفريق بعده ما بدأ والحكومة العراقية كانت الأسبوع الماضي كانت مصرة أن تروح وتفتح المقابر في سنجار بدون توثيق لأن اليو إن ومجلس الأمن بطيئة جدا في هذه الشغلات المهمة اللي نحن بالسنة الخامسة من الإبادة وبعدها عدنا أخواننا وآباءنا وأمهاتنا في المقابر بدون أي اهتمام عدنا آلاف الدلائل عدنا آلاف الـ 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 الأشياء الناجيات الضحايا اللي حكوا عن الجرائم لليوم مع أنه نشتغل مع فريق أمل كلوني من سنتين مع تشتغل مع الضحايا وعلى هذا الشيء لليوم ما شفنا أي داعش في المحكمة مع الحكومة الفرنسية طبعا كل مرة يزيد عندنا الأمل بتحقيق العدالة كل ما نجي على على فرنسا وكل ما ننتقي بالرئيس ماكرون ومن أكثر الدول اللي عملت شيء على الأرض يعني كتير دول رحت وحكومات زرتها كان في تعاطف كان في كلام كان في استقبال بس ما كان في فعل وخلال سنة يعني من من أوغست 2017 نشتغل مع الحكومة الفرنسية قدرنا نزيل إزالة الألغام من سنجار خلال السنة اللي فاتت بمساعدة الحكومة الفرنسية وقبل أسبوعين قرر الرئيس ماكرون أنه يقوم بجلب مئة نسوان من الإيزيديات اللي عدها أطفال وكانت ضحية في في سنجار في عام 2014 والرئيس هو داعم يعني مثل ما وعدني أنه فرنسا داعم لهذا الشيء اللي محاسبة المجرمين وراح تكون دائما مع الضحايا وهذا الشيء يعني شفنا نتائج تأتي بسرعة ونتمنى يعني نأمل من اليو إن مع أني أشتغل معهم من مجلس الأمن أنه القرارات اللي تنطي الأفعال تكون شوية سريعة مو بطيئة
Thank you very much for that, Nadia. And now let me, um, we have about 25 minutes left. And please offer questions to Nadia, in addition to the rest of the panel. Um, again, I'll, I have some on my iPad that are coming through, including a whole bunch of notes that say, Nadia, in five minutes, in one minute, she's here. I've missed all of that. But as you see, she's here. So we're good. Um, but let me uh, please uh, first take some questions from the audience. Show of hands, one right here in the front, please, sir. Thank you. Um, quick question. Uh, a lot of the issues you discussed are reflective, in my opinion, of interstate wars and the inability to deal with them. And you rightfully, in my opinion, pointed out that they're um, internationalized in a way by prox they're essentially proxy wars in some way. Um, so maybe if we take a step back, a reform of the UN Charter to um, uh, come up with norms, international norms of how to deal with interstate wars and, of course, um, the non-state actors. Maybe that would be a much more holistic um, idea, which would, by extension, include a reformed Security Council. So maybe that's an idea that um, should get some attention. And just for the record, this is not necessarily my point of view, our ideas from a um, career German diplomat who worked for the UN. You, you, you might know Michael Schulenburg. Anyways, I just want to ask that question. Thank you. Martin, you want, you want to take on the notion of charter reform? Well, the charter reform is an interesting topic. Uh, but I think this charter is really great as, as it stands now, except the part of that it's not modern anymore. But uh, the monopoly of power, 2-4, Article 51, Article 99 you mentioned. In principle, everything is there, but the structure and the decision-making processes, they are really suboptimal, and, and the implementation. The, uh, the human rights uh, documents are on the table. Not only the liberal uh, documents, but also the social document, the, the social human rights here. Uh, the two covenants are there. I think we have everything in place. Uh, it's the question of implementation and who does it. It's a question of leadership. It's a question of the structural of the structural reform of the Security Council to make it happen. The value system is in place, and uh, the very impressive uh, kind of statement of, of Nadia here, I mean, shows it. And I only can agree. It's the lack of accountability. I mean, how can this happen? There is impunity for those who commit the gravest, and we know it from the Congo and uh, mass rapes and whatever, who commit the gravest human rights violations, and they are ju it is just impunity. I mean, this we have to change, the implementation to restore the credibility, not so much the changing of, uh, of, of charters or so. Question right behind me. Hi. Uh, this may sound somewhat frivolous, but it isn't. I'm wondering whether you can envision that one of the members of the Security Council be persuaded through public opinion, through its own political inertia, to actually withdraw from the Security Council. It would be interesting to have one resignation from the Security Council. Is this likely? Is this possible? Thank you. Anyone want to take on? I mean, I, I think it, I can imagine the United States doing it, but for a very different reason than you just suggested. John Bolton is the national security advisor, after all. He said you could take eight floors off and we wouldn't miss it. Um, you look like you want to address that. Well, there was one president. Saudi Arabia got elected, and it decided then to walk away, in part presumably because they feared that uh, with the situation in Yemen, they probably would be subjected to a, a larger degree of accountability if they were members of the Security Council. So it was replaced by Jordan. So there is one precedent, although it never really sat. Um, but I don't think countries will walk away from the Security Council because they campaign so heavily to get onto it, in fact. Um, which brings me then, since I have the mic, to yes, the do. issue of a smaller and medium-sized countries. You mentioned the issue of accountability, Martin, which I think is key. But the countries that are fighting today for accountability tend not to be the large ones. The country that is fighting for accountability in Yemen is the Netherlands. The country who fought for accountability in Syria is Liechtenstein. 
That, I think, should put everybody to shame. When countries talk about bandwidth, the EU talks about bandwidth, we don't have the bandwidth. If Liechtenstein could move the General Assembly to adopt an accountability mechanism on Syria, anybody can, any country could. That's clearly, I didn't even want to mention Liechtenstein. It's generally not mentioned, right? So thank you for that. Capital of Liechtenstein is? Vaduz. Very well done. Okay, so look at this, huh? He didn't know I was gonna ask him that. Question is over here. Please. Je voudrais d'entrée de jeu remercier Monsieur Kobler pour ce qu'il vient de dire. Par rapport et je soutiens ce qu'il donne. Il a besoin de leadership effectivement et que le Conseil de sécurité reflète un peu plus l'esprit du XXIe siècle. Monsieur le commissaire Chergui, vous l'avez dit vous aussi, l'Afrique doit participer. Je le dis parce qu'ici, j'ai entendu Madame qui a reçu le prix Nobel de la paix, justement, dire qu'il y a beaucoup de résolutions et autres. Il y a des fosses communes depuis quelques années. Chez nous, ça fait 20 ans qu'il y a des fosses communes qui n'ont jamais eu de suite. Et nous pensons qu'un mort ou dix morts ou plusieurs morts, ce sont des morts et on doit les honorer. Et euh, on doit euh, leur sans cri vengeance. Mais au niveau du Conseil de sécurité, il y a un étranglement. Les choses n'avancent pas. Je suis désolée. Et il faut absolument que l'on puisse avancer, faire avancer les choses. Je ne vais pas donner de solution, mais je pense que euh, c'est vrai que ce sont les membres permanents, sont les représentants des États. Et malheureusement, chaque État qui est là dans ce euh, conseil de sécurité a des intérêts. Et aujourd'hui, je pense que le problème, c'est de séparer les intérêts particuliers et faire primer les intérêts collectifs. Où on vient dans des forums comme celui-ci pour parler euh, sincèrement, pour euh, penser les choses véritablement, plutôt que de considérer qu'on vient... Oui, je vais raccourcir, mais il euh, y a beaucoup de souffrance en moi et vous pouvez comprendre que je ne trouve peut-être pas les mots pour le dire euh, de manière directe. Pour nous, tout ce qui se passe ressemble à des déclarations d'intention. Chaque rapport des Nations Unies, euh, chaque euh, résolution ressemble pour nous pour un vœu pieux. Et ça s'arrête là. Il n'y a pas d'effectivité sur le terrain. Il n'y a pas de suite. Et ça, croyez-moi, nous n'avons plus confiance, en tout cas nous autres. Dernièrement, le Conseil de sécurité était là. Nous leur avons dit, nous leur avons dit, vous venez régulièrement, nous vous disons la même chose, mais il n'y a jamais de résultat. Thank you. Nadia, I want to give you the first chance to respond to that, if you like. أعتقد هاي رسالتنا دائما خلي أنتي مثال صغير على مجتمع إنه إحنا نصف مليون إنسان إيزيدي من الأقلية الإيزيدية منذ أكثر من أربعة آلاف سنة ونحن نعيش في العراق وفي عبر تاريخنا دائما نتعرض لإبادات للتميز الديني ضد الإيزيديين للعنف الجنسي ضد المرأة اليو ان هو او المجلس الامن او المجتمع الدولي ما اخذ ولو مره واحده انه يحمل الاقليات او المجتمعات الصغيره من من الابادات بعدين بعد الابادات نجي ونحكي من بعد اربع سنوات من الاباده كمجتمع باول يوم داعش قتل 5000 شخص سوبيا اكثر من 6500 من النساء والأطفال لو خلال الأربع سنوات اللي فاتت داعش بنفسه شاف عنصر واحد من عناصر داعش بالمحكمة وحاسب على جرائمه كان على الأقل ترك الثلاث آلاف اللي بعتهم بالداعش في سوريا اللي ما نعرف عنهم داعش الناس تقول داعش خلصنا داع العراق من داعش أو نحارب داعش بس مو كل شيء إنه انتهى داعش بالسلاح أو بالحرب لو داعش هو بنفسه حاضر إنه يحارب وهذا فكرهم ويعني خطتهم بس لو شافوا اللي قبلهم خلال الأربع سنوات اتحاسبوا ووصلوا للمحكمة على جرائمهم كان على الأقل 
انطوا حريه ال 3000 اللي بعد بيتهم حتى يتحرروا كان راح يتعلموا درس ولكن مع الاسف اشتغلنا كثير و وكان عيب انه المراه خاصه بدولنا تطلع وتحكي عن ال... عن العنف الجنسي ضد المراه والرساله مثل هاي كالاختصاب والبيع والشراء كسرنا كل هذه الحواجز حتى نوصل للعداله العداله اللي اللي نعتبرها انه حق احنا على حق انه نشوف داعش بالمحكمه كثير قرارات أن... أعطت مجلس الأمن واليو إن وكثير دول أنطت وعود وتعاطف وكلمات بس ما ما أنطت شيء إنه نفرح بالعدالة، العدالة هو الشيء اللي يرجع كرامة الضحايا وكرامة المجتمعات اللي تتعرض للإبادة. Thank you. You want, both want to make comments. If you make them quickly, very because briefly. I want to make sure we get to more people. Yes, very, very briefly. I, w I would like to, um, I mean, uh, uh, reinforce the role of the International Court of Justice. Wherever I was, I went to The Hague and I met Fatou Ben Souda at that time. And I made the experience that, at least in the Congo, this was an argument. Now, I know that. Uh, that there are problems with the International Court of Justice, but the question of accountability. The I, sorry, the ICC, not the ICJ, the ICC. Um, everybody was listening very carefully. Everybody was watching when the SRSG went to see Fatou Ben Souda. And what does he discuss with them? So I, I totally agree that, that the international justice system, the ICC, it has to be strengthened. I know not everybody is a member, but this has, it, has to really, um, it has to be reinforced. And never give up this value system of international accountability. Ahmed. I think it is a shame for the international community, for the United Nations, for humanity that we didn't prevent genocide. However, I would like to mention there are 1, 120,000 peacekeepers in the field who try on an everyday basis to prevent genocide in other places to protect civilians. And I think there's a lot of blame and shame you can put on the United Nations, but it's not that there's nothing happening. And you're not saying that, but the lady here, she mentioned that, that whatever has been discussed, nothing is implemented. There should be much more things implemented, and there should be more prevention for sure, and the, the protection of civilians should be the core of the issue. But I should also mention that the glass if is for sure half empty, but it's also half full for some people. Thank you, Omar. Smell, uh, I briefly. just want to add uh, one word that UN is not inactive in i am coming directly from drc and i have there witnessed just a visit to the east to combat ebola so this is very important so uh, i think what we need is really to reinforce this issue of accountability i mean uh, so you know that uh, daesh and al-qaeda has been somehow imported from uh, to Africa. They are not originally from Africa. And today, many of our countries are suffering from terrorism from these groupings. So what we want is, as I told you before, we need uh, harmony. We need also uh, the international community to, to, to have the same approaches. In the, it's not only because they have developed that strong uh, forces in Iraq to combat uh, Daesh. But Daesh now is in Africa. And uh, my question is why the international community cannot, uh, I mean, uh, have the same engagement so to help us? Because Africa is the less prepared, I mean, to, to combat this, uh, this phenomenon. I mean, together with uh, the underdevelopment, with the uh, uh, take the issue of uh, climate change and its implication on us today. I think, in few words, maybe uh, 80 million in the coming days will have to, one way or another, mm -hmm. migrate within the continent uh, as, as a result of, of this phenomenon. So we need solidarity, 
we need uh, uh, the international community uh, to to be up to the challenges wherever they wherever they are. Uh, ICE is true has been important to Africa, though of course uh, humanity came originally from Africa, so it's all originally your fault. I just want to make sure you know that. Okay, um, the question is right here. Merci beaucoup. Uh, uh, J'ai une question à poser à Monsieur Cobler. Euh, Monsieur Kobler, euh, vous, vous venez de dire euh, euh, que vous, êtes, vous avez parlé de, 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 de la réussite euh, des Nations Unies, notamment au Congo, principalement la mission d'intervention. Donc je parle parce que je suis congolais et je pars travailler avec vous en 2012 dans le cadre de Biligui à Kinshasa euh, pour le, la foire de l'entrepreneuriat féminin dans le cadre de l'autonomisation des femmes. Les Nations Unies au Congo, la mission de mission de paix, c'est depuis 2001, je crois. Près de 20 ans, 2 milliards de dollars, c'est la moitié du budget du Congo. Et lorsqu'on parle de, de, de la réussite de la brigade d'intervention, moi, je suis perdu. Je suis perdu parce que depuis 2011, cette brigade est là. Jusqu'à aujourd'hui, la guerre, les guerres, les tueries, ça continue toujours. Donc, si nous qui sommes la société civile, nous parlons au nom du peuple, la volonté du peuple congolais en termes de citoyens, surtout à l'est du pays, personne n'a confiance à la mission de maintien de paix de l'ONU au Congo. Ça, je l'ai dit en tant que société civile, 20 ans de paix, c'est long, sans réponse. Donc, quand on dit que c'est une réussite, moi, je suis perdu. Donc, je m'arrête là personnellement pour M. Complet. Merci. Thank you. Please, Martin. Well, I totally understand your frustration, and I'm the one who are is still more frustrated on, on the, the lack of success. I've spoken about the success of innovative um, uh, kind of tools like the Force Intervention Brigade. Uh, and um, you know very well that uh, when, when I came to the Congo, I mean, the Intervention Brigade was, was a, new, a new tool. And I was told in New York, yeah, here you have the Intervention Brigade, but never use it. Now, the first commander and myself, we decided uh, differently after Goma was, uh, was bombed dead and, uh, and, there, and there were victims. If you go to Goma nowadays, and this was really, I think, a success of using this new tool of the Force Intervention Brigade, a city of one million is now liberated and the M23 is a thing of the past. Now, but a peacekeeping mission can never replace a political solution. I mean, this is up to the Congolese themselves also to put pressure on their government. We only can assist you. We can help you with innovative elements, but it, it must come from within. So we cannot replace a lack of political, of political solution. You mentioned the Libya example, same thing. You can, might be a good leader, yes, but you cannot replace the political will of those who do not want to have this peace. And this is up to the civil society. That's why I'm very grateful that you put this question. We only can assist you with all we have. Okay, I'm going to try. We have a bunch of questions. I'll try to get to at least two or three more. One here, one here. We'll see if we can get to more. Please start. It's working. Salamu alaikum. The United Nations Security Council was established as the declarative steward of calling out on injustice and accordingly crafting peaceful solutions. My question for you this evening is twofold. Firstly, has diplomacy proven itself to not be the sufficient mechanism for enabling and cascading inclusive and feasible peace? And secondly, to further expand on my question to you, do we actually need to rethink the composition of membership in the United Nations Security Council so that it doesn't just include states, but private sector and civil society as permanent committees within that mechanism. And the example that I just believe needs to be pointed out is when our beloved Nadia was invited as a guest of honor at the UNSC. It made me think to myself, when we are talking about the Yazidi genocide, 
Who is the guest at the table? Is it the survivor who is talking to us about what is really happening on the ground, or the UNSC who is stepping in to listen, understand, and do something about it? Thank you. Alma, to you. Thank you. I think this is a very valid uh, question, but I guess it's rather a statement uh, than a question. And I would uh, totally agree. The issue is, who then, if now with the P5, I think we all agree, this is not reflecting geopolitical realities of the year 2018. And we all agree it would be great to have civil society, to have business. But then, who is going to decide that who's going to sit there? So I think as a really a more a measurement of realpolitik, it's the question to use more the formats like the ARIA formula they are using, and uh, Bruno is an expert uh, on this and many other issues, is to bring in people who really know what's happening on the ground and to bring them in early on, not when it's too late. When there is, we were talking about early warning. I think this is something that everybody loves. I only think early warning sounds great, but only if there's early action. So you have to bring people who are suffering from whatever the issue is, conflict in various forms, against women, against children, against humanity, against certain groups. We have to bring people to the Security Council, not as permanent members, but to make their voice heard. Because I think it's so much more impressive to talk to persons and to people who have suffered than to read a report. Uh, I'm so glad. You, I mean, we've talked about leadership, we've talked about regions, we've talked about structure, but one additional really important piece is expertise. There's such a war against science in politics these days, and injecting actual science and expertise gets you closer to solutions than you might otherwise get. I have a question right here. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I actually heard uh, remarks that perturbed me a little. I work a lot in the space of sexual abuse and violence. And when I hear of talk directed towards survivors who face the worst kind of humanity, worst of humanity, yet showcase the best of humanity, exhibit being Nadia, when I hear talks directed towards her saying, but look at the glass as half full, look at what great work we're doing in other communities, that means nothing to survivors whose bodies have been subject to the worst kind of abuse and they've lost lives. So my question to you, Nadia, is how do we hold these spaces, these powerhouses accountable to say, no, we will not settle to look at the glass half full, do better by us. So my question to you, Nadia, is the kind of incredible inspiration and hope that we all look at you for. What is the international community doing in terms of failing you? How can we highlight those failures to hold them accountable to do better and to never have to say, look at the glass as half full? Thank you. Uh, a fair but not an easy question. Uh, Nadia, please. I always like to say that I see a difficult time after the prayers. I think that the prayers are or جرائم ضد ضد جروبات كاملة أو دول كاملة يأخذ أسبوع أو شهور إنه توقف شيء كبير مثل هذا يحدث ولكن بعد فوات الأوان يأخذ سنين أو قرن حتى حتى ترجع الثقة حتى تنعمر حتى حتى تنسى لما لما نقول اللي اللي صار قليل إنه على الأرض والأفعال قليلة سواء ضد الإرهاب أو اللي للضحايا لأننا لأننا لا نرى لا نرى الكثير لما نقول إنه ما في الكثير على الأرض خلينا نروح على على الفريق فريق التوثيق اللي راح اللي وافق عليه اليو إن المجلس الأمن إنه يروح على على العراق على سنجار صار سنة ونص وافق اليو إن على هذا الفريق والفريق بعده ما ابتدى الأسبوع اللي راح العراق كانت مصرة إنه تروح تفتح المقابر وإحنا ما نؤمن 
بالمحاكم وبالتوثيق اللي من قبل العراق نريد محاكم دوليه آه عملنا كثير آه تليفونات ومسجات حتى بس نقدر نوقف هذه المقابر لان نريد تكون من 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 قبل اليو ان من قبل مجلس الامن لان عندنا ثقه بعد اكبر ونشوف انه ما راح يتكرر هاي الاشياء اذا تكون من قبل اليو ان فلماذا تاخذ سنه ونص نصف بعد ان توافق على فريق تاخذ سنه ونصف حتى تبتدي مع انه نشتغل مع رئيس الفريق سيد كريم خان وهو بعد ما الفريق ما يعرف امتى راح يبدا فصعب انه يعني اشياء صعبه تصير انه بالقوه نسيطر عليها حتى نتامل الاكثر من اليو ان ونتامل الاحسن من الامم المتحده ومن مجلس الامن. Unfortunately um, to all of you in the audience we are out of time. Uh, oh, yes, of course, I need that. Unfortunately, to all of you in the audience, we are out of time. Um, I really appreciate everyone's questions. There were several that I would have loved to have gotten to, but I, I hope you appreciate, uh, and if you join me in showing that to an extraordinary group of individuals, all uh, doing their damnedest to really make a difference in this space. Thank you for your questions and your participation today. We hope we'll see all of you next year. Thank you.